Hi, um, this is Bess Coy, your teacher. I'm going to talk about the art basics. It's a longer PowerPoint in a video. I want to talk about the categories of art, features of a work of art, the elements, the principles, and different aesthetic theories. Uh, there's three different categories of art. So if we had art, we could divide them into three different categories based on if it's realistic. Like this looks pretty realistic. It wouldn't have to be a realistic painting it could be a realistic sculpture so it has realistic quality artwork could also be in the category of abstract meaning it's recognizable but it's distortions like even cartooning comes into abstraction so recognizable but really distorted non-objective artwork is just mostly about the elements and principles and it lacks a, a strict um, design or a pattern but the tricky thing about these three paintings is they were actually done by the same artist, Pablo Picasso. When he was younger, he was had realistic art formal training, and he learned how to do things very accurately. As he was older, he was influenced by art from other countries, like from Africa. So then he, he pioneered a whole um, style of art based on um, cubism, meaning he liked things to look fractured, have multiple points of view, you could see um, the strong line quality like you would actually see in an uh, African mask. And he took cubism that he pioneered so far, it was almost analytical, meaning it was hard to see anything at all. Um, but if you look closely, this is a person. Here is the head, the shoulders, down into the elbows, uh, kind of a torso here. So again, artist was Pablo Picasso, but he did all different categories, whether it was realistic artwork, abstract, or non-objective. So I've talked about art a little bit. Fine art actually has three requirements for something to really be considered fine art, not just like a craft project. Fine art needs to have subject matter, meaning what is it? What do you identify with it? Is it a portrait, a landscape? What is it? Composition is your arrangement. That means your whole entire plan about what you're going to be doing visually. Uh, composition um, could be a written composition, a musical composition. For us, it's a visual composition or a visual arrangement. Fine art also must have content. It is some kind of message. It's something the artist is trying to tell us. A lot of modern content could be controversial. It could be um, educational. It could be political. So fine art has to have those three requirements, excuse me, to be uh, considered fine art. So talking about the elements and the principles. The elements are actually the building blocks of art. It's our basic language of art. They're called the elements of art or the elements of design. It's the same thing. They're the basics. They're line, color, value, form, shape, texture, and even space. The principles of design organize the elements for different effects. They would be unity, balance, emphasis, contrast, pattern, rhythm, and movement. Um, lines are first element we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about it for quite a while because it's very useful. You can see lines that were painted by this uh, Norwegian artist. His name is Edward Munch. It looks like Munch, but it's Munch, and he painted the screen. He used lines that are diagonal lines, curvy lines, wide lines, thin lines. He used lines to really symbolize emotion, and he wanted his work to show emotion. In fact, that's him right here. This is his self-portrait back in the day. Um, so he was actually asking him the qu himself this question. Um, why am I not as others are? Why am I not as other people are? Actually, there's two people on the end of this pier. And uh, he's like feeling lonesome. He's feeling like really overwhelmed. He even uses color and shapes and lines to even add more of that, uh, oh, total sense of like overwhelmed anxiety. So this is his self-portrait asking himself, why am I not as others are? Just lonesome, just feeling ill, depressed. And he used color and line to show that. Um, line can also make shapes. You can see how this curved line actually makes this shape right here. So lines that connect make shapes. Lines also create our fonts that we use from reading. So lines actually um, are a very versatile art element. 
Lines and points work together. Now, if there's only one point, a mark made on a blank page, there's something built into the brain that wills meaning for it. It seeks some kind of relationship or order. If there's two points, immediately the eye will see a connection and see a line. So what you see right here is even if you just see two dots, you're going to see a line. If you see three dots, you're going to start to see a triangle. Um, and a lot of time advertisers do this as well. Uh, if you're seeing three points, um, you're automatically, again, going to see some kind of triangle, and it's called gestalt or grouping. And all that means is you're starting to see things that is like this invisible triangle, just created with dots that make the lines. So dots and lines work together. It's almost like geometry. Uh, we're still talking about line, and now we're looking at lines that we can combine um, as in this illustration from Leonardo da Vinci's sketchbook. You can see lines that create the shapes and the form and the patterns. All that is created by line. And you can even see lines used when he was writing um, his journals in his sketchbook. On the bottom of your first page, you will see a box, and I want you to write the letter of your first name. Now, my first name is Beth, and I would draw a big B, but I want it dashed. It says lines are not always continuous. They can be implied. So I want you to write the letter of your name uh, with dashed letters for there. And it reminds us again, lines don't have to be continuous. As we're still talking about line, I want to look at line as you see in architecture. We're going to specifically talk about horizontal lines. And horizontal lines are like our horizon that go from side to side. Horizontal lines suggest a feeling of rest. Objects parallel to the Earth are at rest in relationship to gravity. Therefore, compositions in which horizontal lines dominate tend to be quiet and restful in feeling. One of the hallmarks, meaning characteristics, of Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture, his style is strong horizontal elements which stress the relationship of the structure to the land. So how would he do this? He built this house actually out of uh, local materials. He has lots of windows. He actually built it um, over a water waterfall. So there's places in this house that you can look outside, but you can actually look down through a clear floor in certain areas and actually see and hear the waterfall. So he wanted you to feel at so calm and at rest with nature. It's all about putting you in nature. So um, that's his style. It it's, was considered very modern. And this home is called Falling Water, and I believe it's in Wisconsin. Um, vertical lines go up and down. All right, vertical lines are up and down. It says vertical lines commute a feeling of loftiness and spirituality. Erect lines seem to extend upward, upwards beyond human reach toward the sky. They often dominate public architecture from cathedrals to corporate headquarters. So if we look at this style of artwork, it's actually early Byzantine. It usually has a religious subject matter. Um, they usually make deities um, look a little bit taller, um, and that just gives a sense of power. So again, um, you'll just see that uh, strong vertical lines give that sense of dominance. As we scoot down through now down here, diagonal lines. Diagonal lines are going to go all the way down from one side to another. Diagonal lines suggest a feeling of movement or direction, like something's rising or falling. This uh, painting here by Marcel Duchamp, it looks like a Picasso cubism, and he was influenced by Picasso's cubism. The title of this is actually Nude Descending a Staircase. And you're going to think, nude, hmm, well, let's check it out. There's the head, there's the torso, there's kind of the rump, and you can see a thigh, a shin, and you know, what would be the feet going down the steps. So nude descending the staircase. So it is pretty abstract. Um, and the diagonal lines, again, make it look like there is a lot of movement and action going on in this painting. So diagonal lines show action. Uh, when we look at two more types of lines, you can see lines like zigzag lines and then the opposite of that down here. Zigzag lines show confusion, anxiety, electricity, uh, they even symbolize mountains, like in this design that you see right here. So um, they just give you that sense of something's happening. Lines have emotion, too, like you see down here in this painting by Franz 
Marx, who was a German artist, one of my most favorite artists. Um, the sh soft, shallow curves suggest comfort, safety, relaxation. They are somewhat sensuous because they look like the curves of a human body. Um, this painting is abstract, too, because the horses aren't really blue, but he used blue as symbolic color to mean something to him. So Franz Marc, um, just a really innovative German artist, um, right around the time of World War I. This painting is actually in uh, Minneapolis at the Walker Art Center. And you can actually go see this painting. And it is absolutely just gorgeous, glowing with color. And it's also one of my favorites because of all the curved lines. It's just a very gentle, graceful picture uh, or painting. So this is all about line. Now we're going to start talking about the element of value. Value is lightness and darkness. When you're in a drawing class, you do value with a pencil, lights and darks, or with charcoal. In painting, you could have black and white paint and mix your values of lights and darks. So this talks about how um, lights and darks can make things look a little bit more 3D. In fact, the Italian term is chiaro oscuro. Chiaro means a light, and oscuro means dark. So getting the lights and darks. As I scoot down through color, you're going to be drawing the color wheel actually um, on your grade sheet. They typically put yellow at the top of the color wheel, and there's 12 colors on the color wheel. And this same poster is hanging up in our classroom, but yellow, blue, and red are three primary colors. The orange, the green, and violet are our three secondary colors. And the six intermediate colors right through here um, are made by a combination of your primary and your secondary. So it would be the yellow-green, blue-green, blue-violet, red-violet, red-orange, yellow-orange. So when you look at the color spectrum, our Roy G. Biv, if you take a Roy G. Biv spectrum, or the rainbow, and bend it, you will get the color wheel. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, or your Roy G. Biv bent will give you that color wheel. On uh, the next section on your on your worksheet is asking for words that are very tiny, very small. In fact, right here, shades, tints, and tones. Shades is when you have your color and you're adding a little black. Uh, tints is when you have your color and your white and you're mixing white and your color together. And it's tone is when you're having gray with your color. And if you're thinking, you, why do you want gray with your color? Those are the colors that you need more for nature and um, and things like that. Um, when you think about intensity, intensity is not the same thing as value. Value is when you're adding white, black, and gray. Intensity, boom, it's like a war. It's like taking two opposite colors and mixing them together. So this artist, uh, it looks like he did it in Photoshop, did this with red and green. So red is across from green on the color wheel. And when you mix them together, you'll be able to start to see it neutralizes each other. It gets kind of goes from bright to dull. So intensity is the brightness or the dullness of mixing two complementary or opposite colors. This is fun to do in paint. You can also do it with violet and yellow. And you'll get some beautiful plums and golden colors. And um, almost kind of some warm brownish neutral colors and dull colors. And I also do this with orange and blue and mix those opposites. You're going to get some beautiful um, rust kind of colors all the way to some dark Prussian blue colors and some neutral colors in the middle. So it goes from those bright, beautiful colors to the dull colors in the middle. And it's from mixing opposites. Even holidays use these opposite colors because they look good together. Um, think about sports teams that use colors on jerseys that are opposite colors, they just look well together and nice and bright. Or what is it, like the Bengals or some sports thing that use these colors? But again, working with colors with value, intensity, knowing those 12 colors on your color wheel, and again, shades, tints, and tones. Well, here are two paintings, um, and they're still working with color. You can see warm colors and cool colors. The artist that painted this was Pablo Picasso. Uh, as I scoot down, I'm scooting down. You can see it's even warm colors and cool colors in advertising. 
you can see that um, colors uh, can affect colors next to them, whether they're weaker or stronger. So sometimes it'll look like um, this one might look a little bit darker than this green. It's the same. Or this one looks like a little slightly different than this yellow. Maybe this looks like almost like a pea green or not quite as bright. So sometimes colors affect um, each other depending on what color is next to it. Texture. And the E is hiding back here. Texture refers to surface qualities. Whether it's visual textures that you're making or if it's actual textures you're photographing like this American artist Ansel Adams. He's one of America's uh, most prominent, uh, famous uh, black and white wildlife photographers. Like totally back in the day when you had big cameras and a dark room, all pre-digital. He was the master of getting textures, whether they're very close or very far. So textures are about surface quality. As I'm scooting down, I'm going to talk about space. Space has to do with depth. When we look at this work by M.C. Escher, um, we can see he's got things in the foreground and little things in the background. He liked to have crowded space in his work. This is called Bond of Union. And he plays a game with like positive and negative. So it's like this is all connected, but it still continues on. And where you think is almost the same thing that your partner thinks. See how you start to think the same? And that's just kind of his play on relationships. But again, it's a positive and negative. It can have overlapping, bigger things in front, smaller things in back. And that has to do with depth and space. Um, it also can work with perspective, as you can see in one-point perspective, two-point perspective, and even atmospheric perspective. That's all, again, ways to get the illusion of depth. Um, shapes are coming up, and shapes are flat. Um, you can see this um, painting here actually by a modern artist. His name is Keith Haring. He uses shapes um, almost like um, a graffiti style mural um, modern expressionism to, um, to show that the lines create the different organic shapes. Shapes can also be geometric like this painting down here by Piet Mondrian. And believe it or not, he used to be a realist. He liked everything totally accurate and he finally started to simplify things so much it's just geometric, like rectangles and squares. So uh, organic flat shapes or geometric flat shapes. Uh, and here we go. This is what you're going to be drawing actually on your grape sheet. Natural shapes would be like a flat leaf shape. And sometimes shapes are used to communicate like this wheelchair. When I was traveling abroad to visit my son, it was so easy actually to go different countries and just look for signs because then you would be able to look at the shapes, look at the easy signs, and, and know where bathrooms was, food, the hospital, transportation, where to change your cash. But this is what you're going to be drawing. And what this does is it helps you realize that simple shapes, um, meaning abstracted, stylized, simple shapes, actually can communicate. Uh, let me scoot down a little bit. And um, let's talk about squares. Squares um, are so common. What we read in a square would seem to be true. So, so much of the text we read is in a square. And shares kind of give that uh, sense of uh, honesty, stability. When you see circles, they're like great big hugs. Whatever you see in a circle seems to be uh, protective, it's soft, it's comforting. Um, so, it's almost like the globe. Um, so circles suggest and give that shape, gives you a sense of um, something that's protective. Triangles, because they have so many uh, diagonal lines, are all about action. And sometimes they even point the, the way for readers to look. This is what you're going to draw in your grade sheet. This is shapes. Shapes are not always created by forming lines. These shapes are actually uh, faces that create the vase. So it says, do you see a vase or two faces? So it's almost a battle between what's the positive and what's the negative area or shapes. All right, It's actually called a figure-ground relationship, and a lot of artists would do this on purpose for you to start to look at shapes that actually create the lines. And let me scoot down one more and talk about uh, form. Form and volume. 
Form is more three-dimensional, like height, width, and depth. And shapes are more two-dimensional, which is like this square. Our challenge is to learn, learn how to make geometric shapes start to look like three-dimensional form. And you can see that's what we would be doing in a drawing class, whether we're doing it with highlights and shadows. And um, space again. Oh, let's go up to here. Space can also be considered positive and negative. Whether you see the space of this chair, which is a classy looking chair. I like the curved lines. I like the little openings. They're not buttons. They're like openings that you can see through. So uh, space is considered positive or negative. And it also is about foreground, middle ground, background. So the first part of this video is all about the elements. The second part of this video is going to be all about the principles of design.